You know, that's uh, Jeremiah, that's my son, five years old. Um, before that time, that was his first time um, making it to the top. He had never made it past halfway, and he made that first climb past the halfway point, and then just as a dad, I watched that, and I've kind of watched it over and over now. I, it makes me so proud to see my son at age five overcoming those fears, accomplishing those goals, um, it's a really cool special moment. All it is is a rock climbing wall, but he just was able, he was stuck. He was kind of paralyzed and then he finally took that next step and then he went to the top and he got it. That day, he, gave, he went to the top um, at least four more times um, after that. And I was just, as a, I, I was so proud. Rita, as a mom, she was right there. I don't know if you heard her screaming and yelling. Come on, you can do it, you got it, you got it. And he did it. I know our Heavenly Father, I just know when he sees his children, overcoming their fears, overcoming those obstacles, taking that next step. He is so proud of you. He is so proud of his children when they take those next steps. For a lot of us, um, it's hard because we're scared. You're like, I'm scared. I'm really scared. And he's stuck on the wall and we feel like we can't go. Uh, we all have natural fears. Anybody in here um, clowns? Anybody? <laughs> I saw uh, it was at the Red Box this week, and I almost freaked out whenever I saw it. I'm like expecting a clown to just kind of pop out, out of nowhere. Uh, spiders? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Snakes? Snakes? I got. It. All right. How about the dark? Does anybody still like you turn the lights out at the end of the night? And you're going up the stairs, and you take two steps, and you're cool. You're cool, and then what? You're like, I'm booking it up the stairs. Right? Okay. All right. Admit that here. Anyone, Super Bowls, two weeks away, as I already mentioned it. Is anyone afraid of a, a Vikings Jaguars uh, Super Bowl match? <laughs> Some of you don't even know that a team named the Vikings or the Jaguars exists, which is why everybody's not rooting for, for that. I'm just helping you when you go to the Super Bowl party, if it's Blake Bortles versus Case Keenum, I'm just kind of trying to set you up a little, like nobody knows who they are. So you can bring a little bit to the table when you go. I actually might want to play the board games at the Super Bowl party this year, if that's the case. But we have natural fears that kind of come our way. We're in a series called The Best Is Yet To Come. And last week we talked about how our our source of power, our source of strength, that the best is yet to come, is not rooted in us, it's not rooted in our circumstances, that that is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that, that Jesus lived his life, claimed to, be this, claimed to be God, and that's what got him killed. He predicted that he was going to die and then raise from the grave, and he did it. If that event didn't happen, we're, what we're here for is nothing. And, that, and the fact that God took death and turned it into life, that he conquered sin, that that gives us hope in any situation that we're facing. That we have hope that the best is yet to come. Now, I know for myself, when we talk about Freedom Church, and we, talk, we looked at Jesus' first sermon, and Jesus preached last, when we looked at it last week, he said, I've come to proclaim freedom to the captives. And that's, that's what our message is, is to go and to proclaim and tell other people about Jesus and to proclaim that freedom. Now, if you've received that freedom, that's such an amazing feeling. But I just know for myself as an individual, as a, as a Christian, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, all the baggage didn't go away. Like, there's some, still a lot of things, a lot of junk in my life, and it keeps me from living like the best is yet to come. The title of today's message is God Can Use Me. But if I'm honest, a lot of my fears will reverse that. Instead of being an emphatic, yes, I'm going to claim it, God can use me, it turns more into a, God can use me? And I start to look at my failures. I start to look where I don't know enough. I, thought, I, I start to... to look into my insecurities, and all of that's rooted really in fear. And I can't quite get past those fears. What I want to look at today, we're going to continue looking into Acts, but before we get there, I want, to, I want you to dive into a, a passage in Luke with me in Luke chapter 4. 
Because I, I want you to see the kind of God that you serve. The kind of God that sent his son to die for you and I to help us live in that freedom. Jesus preached his first sermon in Acts chapter 4. But there's a, probably a little bit more popular scripture or passage in scripture that you know that starts in, in verse 1. And it's Jesus getting tempted. Luke chapter 3, Jesus gets baptized. And basically his ministry is getting ready to launch. But right after his baptism, he gets tempted. So I want to look at this together. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He just got baptized. Now my son, Charlie, who's two years old, he likes to run around, and whenever he changes directions, he'll go, run, 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 and he goes, Err! and then he'll run. And so it's kind of funny. If you see him, he'll just, anytime he kind of changes direction, Err! 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 Scripture does a little, Err! right here because I don't, I don't get this. This one kind of frustrates me. It says Jesus had this great moment. He got baptized, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. That doesn't add up to me. Sometimes I think God should do some certain things. Leading us into the wilderness is not one of those things. I don't know that I like this one, God. I might kind of question you on this one. Led by the Spirit. Listen, God, He is not afraid to send you into the wilderness. That that's what it's going to be to get you prepared. Jesus not only was tempted here by the, by, by the devil, He was tempted throughout His entire ministry to give up, to stop short, to never reach the goal. In this, I'm not going to read the scripture, but in this, in this passage where he's tempted, if you're the Son of God, if you're the Son of God, then do this. If you're the Son of God, do this. Throughout his ministry, people said, hey, if you're God, do a miracle. Put on a show for us. Do something. He's hanging on the cross. His final moments. And he's trying to break him. If he's really the Son of God... Why didn't he just take himself down? He could save others, but he can't save himself. From start to finish, it was going to try to stop him from what God wanted him to accomplish. I know for, for you and I, I, we live in these types of, of fear of these things. Jesus, God was not afraid. We, we serve a God that's, that's on the offense. He's, hey, I'm going to send my, my son here, and this is going to get him prepared even more. I, he, he's going to strike the first blow. Jesus talks about his relationship with Satan in, in another passage of Scripture where he says, I can just stroll in there and plunder in his house. I, 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 there's no problem. There's no contest. We serve a God that's not afraid, and he does not lose. He's never lost, and he doesn't, he doesn't count on losing. He was not afraid to send his son into the wilderness. <coughs> One of our core values at first, at, 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 sorry, excuse me, that's a, I'm used to saying First Baptist Church, Los Alamos, sorry, I've been there for 10 years. At Freedom Church, one of our core values, we are faith-filled risk takers. We are faith-filled risk takers. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love, and of self-control, or self-discipline, or self discipline depending on the translation. We don't live in, in a, we don't have a God that gives us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. And He wants us to walk in that. Those first disciples in Acts, they got it. They received that spirit of power, and then they went, and they lived it out. When Jesus met the devil in the wilderness. We use that passage like, oh, we've got to memorize scripture because he, he recounted scripture. Well, listen, it's not a Harry Potter thing. He's not like, expel the artist! And, and, you know, pow, the devil's gone. No, he was full of the spirit when he walked in. And the spirit led him throughout all of those temptations to overcome and provide the victory. And when he left, it says, then Jesus returned to Galilee, Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. 
and he goes right in to preach his first sermon. The, the disciples in Acts received the power of the Holy Spirit. Said, hey, hey, wait in Jerusalem, you're going to receive the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, I want to encourage you to read it. They received the Spirit, Pentecost, that's what we call it. Peter preaches an awesome message, thousands of people get saved, the church takes off. Chapter 3, we read chapter 3, a little bit of it. Peter and John go to church, and they heal a man there. When they heal the man, everyone becomes amazed. They're like, oh my gosh, we've seen this guy. Now he's walking around. What's going on? Peter says he sees the opportunity. He preaches a sermon. As he's preaching that sermon to everyone around, they get arrested. <laughs> They're in the Jewish courts, the Jewish temple courts. Those Jewish leaders, not necessarily too high on Jesus. They just tried to kill him. They did kill him. And now here's the Christians talking more about Jesus. Can you imagine that for a, a, a message, preaching, and then here comes the, the police to come and arrest you and put you in jail? It says that they grew to 5,000 that day. What an invitation. Your pastor gets arrested after preaching a sermon, and people still get saved. God was moving. And where I want to pick up today is in the middle of their court trial. They get arrested. The next day, they're at court, and it's with the high priest, and we're going to pick up in verse 8. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. They asked Peter and John, by what name did you heal this man? What did you do? What was going on? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we now being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you, you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There's salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Peter was free. He was unchained here. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Can God use me? Can God know to use me? Listen, if you know anything about the Scriptures, if you know anything about the Bible, and you know anything about Peter, you've got to know that he was, he was the one that shouldn't be saying what he's saying. I've got to think that Peter was struggling in this moment because didn't Peter know his past? Didn't Peter know that just a few weeks before, he had totally denied knowing Jesus? Didn't Peter know that he, he, he was questioned, hey, aren't you one of his guys? He's his best friend. And Peter says, I don't know the guy. Three times, I don't know the guy. I don't know the guy. Didn't Peter know that he had really messed up there? Didn't Peter know, hey, he had gotten out of the boat with the disciples? And yeah, he took a few steps on the water, but then what? He sank. And then Jesus, when he said, picked him up out of the water, said, why do you, why do you have so little faith? Didn't Peter... Know that? And then there was that time that Jesus called him Satan? <laughs> God! Did, didn't Peter know these things in his past that he shouldn't be the one to, to, to tell these guys about that? Or how about his present? It says in the scriptures that he was, these were ordinary men with no special training. No special training in the Greek is idiotes. Anyone want to know what word we get from idiotes? Idiot. Ignoramus. You have no business being here. They, they knew. They knew what was Peter's trade. He wasn't a rabbi. He was a fisherman. And back in the day, one of the things that you can bet that that meant was when, when, when Peter was a little boy and he went to school, either he couldn't afford it or if he was into school, he didn't make the cut. 
He didn't make it into the rabbi class. At some point, he was told, Peter, you're not good enough. And you're not moving on. It's time to go pick up the trade that your dad did. Be a fisherman. He was, he's standing amongst his peers that one, he was not good enough to be in their presence. Didn't he know that? And certainly, didn't he know his life was on the line? I mean, if anything was to be afraid of in this moment, Peter, you speak up. You're on the chopping block next, dude. He, he didn't have the luxury of leading, reading the rest of Acts to know how this thing's going to play out. I mean, didn't he know these things? Our fears can hold us back. It's, it's, it's these moments where we know these things, and that's when the devil... When you're in that little place of wilderness, you're filled with the Spirit. You want to go take that next step, but Satan does not want you to. And he's going to whisper, don't, don't you know your past? Don't you know how you failed? You're going to try to parent your kids and talk about that, but you screwed up so bad. And you think you're going to tell them that? You're an idiot. Hypocrite. You, you, go, you go to church, you're going to try to teach, you're going to try to help, but don't you know what you did? Don't you know what you've done, how you failed, how you messed up? You're going to fail. You are a failure. You're broken. You might as well just return to the dust where you came from. Satan will use those lies. And we will, we will, we will live in bondage and not be free of what God's called us to do. But listen, we serve a God who's not afraid. Have you heard His voice? Do you know what He does with dust? He creates. He gives life. He, 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 brings, he, brings, he brings those dreams and those hopes and those desires to, to life, to birth the things. And God speaks into the moment. There's a, there's a scripture in, in the book of Mark at the end. Mark was written by Mark. But we believe that it was Peter who was kind of dictating to Mark. It's kind of like Peter's story through Mark as he's writing it down. And, and in Mark it says this. This is so good. After the resurrection, an angel is letting them know that Jesus is alive. And they say, go and tell the disciples, and then there's this little thing, including Peter. Peter's story. None of the other Gospels record this. Peter's story says, go and tell all the disciples, which he is one of them, and Peter. Peter had just denied Jesus. I think he needed that encouragement from, from Jesus. To say, hey, tell Peter it's okay. I know you're broken. I know you messed up. We're good. We're good. God loves you. Satan wants to accuse you and lay on the hammer and keep you from working out of That's why he's going to threaten you. Because you are a threat. He's going to try to stop you all the way. And God wants you to overcome. He wants us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. One step out of fear, one step out of our insecurities, and one step into faith. And all it takes is one step for you to pivot and go the other way in what the direction that God has called you to do. There's three things we're going to look at in this passage of Scripture with Peter in front of these guys that's going to give us some direction how we can go from fearful to faithful. How we can go from broken to bold. How we can be from a warrior to a warrior. Right? The first one is spend time with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. You want to change your perspective? You want to get a different look on how things are? Spend time with Jesus. It says that the members of the council were amazed by their boldness. They could see they were ordinary men with no special training. Idiots. Again, if you've ever felt like an idiot, you, it is, you are a perfect uh, candidate to be used by God. Right? They were turned from idiots into genius because they had a faithful heart and an open mouth to speak when God told them to speak. But then it goes on to say, they also recognized them as men who had been 
with Jesus. These guys believed. They had been with Jesus. They saw him. They witnessed him die. And then they saw him raised from the dead. And then they saw him ascend into heaven. They had no earthly reason to continue on with this. Their life was on the line. And as we know through church history, that they pretty much were all executed. No earthly reason to follow this guy except for it was true. That when they saw this happen, it's like, hey, we don't care what's on the line. We've got to follow this. We will live boldly for what we believe deeply. You and I will live boldly for what we believe deeply. Restaurants, Chick-fil-A, I love it. Chick-fil-A sauce, oh, I'm going to talk about it, right? Right? Yeah. You go see a movie or you're Netflix uh, binging on that series and you're like, man, I skipped work for like three days so I could watch like all five seasons and then you're going to go and you're going to talk about this series, that's amazing. For me, I go into Smith's, Halo Top ice cream, anybody. Anybody Halo Top ice cream? Okay, okay, okay. It's, it's ridiculous. It's amazing. I'm a believer, all right? We will live and speak boldly about what we believe deeply. These guys, when they saw the resurrection, they went from fear to bold. And there was no stopping them. They believed it. And we talked last week that belief was not just knowledge, it was a verb. And they go and they live this thing out. You see it play out in Acts over and over and over again. And then they were told later in this, in this episode, they said, okay, we're going to release you guys, but do not use the name of Jesus anymore. Just stop it. No more Jesus. And this was the response. Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Can't stop. Not going to stop. Can't stop. Spend time with Jesus, and it's going to change your perspective. If that's getting into the Word, get into the Word, because it is living and active, and it is going to speak. If you're like, well, I don't understand it, it's kind of written weird. Listen, we have more access to information than ever before. So that the excuse of, I don't understand it, I don't understand it. But I go, and I get the information so I can understand it. Listen, eternity is on the line here, folks. Eternities on it. It is worth looking up and figuring these things out. Number two, God has something for you. Don't miss it. This is all about expectation and anticipation. That God is on the move. That He's alive and He wants to work with you. He can use you. He wants to use you. He will use you. God has something for you. Don't miss it. In Acts chapter 3 verse 12, it's this little line and I kind of read over it and I don't think about it. But when they healed that man, everybody went crazy. They came to check things out. And it says, Peter saw his opportunity. See that? He saw the opportunity. He understood in the moment what was going on, that the Spirit was moving, and now's the time. Now's the time to speak up. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed, his, and addressed the crowd. It works together. You spend time with Jesus... And then you let the Spirit work through you, you're going to see opportunities and they're going to fall in your lap time and time and time again. When I worked at the lab, I remember one morning I was, I was uh, having a quiet time of prayer in the morning. And sometimes, just to try to hear from God, I would just go silent. I'm not reading. Um, it's kind of a time of prayer. I, but I just try to just quiet nothing. And that's, that is weird and hard in our, in our day and age where we just want to go, 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 go to just settle our mind and be still before God and say, God, speak. So a lot of times there's nothing. Okay, I'll be honest. I, I go and, and, and there's nothing. Uh, there's other times when I don't get necessarily a band or anything, but I get that refreshing spirit talk from God. God, Mike, I love you. I got plans for you. You're doing awesome. Keep going. It's just this encouragement. That it come to get the, the other voices um, away from me. I just hear from God. But one morning, I had that time, and it was it was just I didn't hear anything audible, but you just know that it's God. And He said, "Mike, when the time comes, I want you to to tell others about me. When the time comes, I want you to tell others about me today." I what? I knew that I had a trip down to Albuquerque with some coworkers from the lab that day. So I knew it was probably going to be there, but I was like, I knew these guys, and I'm like, no, listen, guys, <laughs> when the time comes, you better make you better make it happen, because I'm not bringing it up. I mean, you're just you do it. 
So we go down, we go to a workshop in Albuquerque, and, I, and I'll be honest, I totally forgot about it. I totally forgot about that time in the morning. And so we're on our way back, we're in the Pawaukee, and we're, we're, we're uh, going down the ramp to where the overpass is, to the right is City of the Gold, and then you're going to take that left at the stoplight to head up to Los Alamos. We stopped at that stoplight, and somehow the, the conversation had gone towards Islam, and, and talking about what do they believe, and whatever. And then the guy in the front seat turns around and says, well, Mike, you're a Christian. What do you guys believe about this? <laughs> and he goes like, boom, here it is. I totally forgot. But the, the way the conversation was going, they wanted to know the gospel. What, what is the Christian perspective? What is the gospel? So I did. I, I just knew that that was the most. So I did. I wish I had a story where we just like all pulled over to the side and, um, and they got saved and then there was water somewhere. And <laughs> no, nothing. Not, not, nothing happened, but I was faithful in the moment. Spending time with Jesus. Understanding the moment. And seeing those two collide. Boldness. Boldness. The fear goes away. God's called me to do something. Oh, here it is. Now's my moment and I go. Jesus had told and prepped Peter and the disciples for these moments. In Luke 12, Jesus told them, And when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry how to defend yourself or what to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time what needs to be said. If I'm honest, that moment, as great as it was, that was 10 years ago. I wish I had a ton of stories. A lot of times I came into that. But, it, but as you did it for me, I don't have those stories over and over and over again, but I want them. I want them. I want that to not just be a rare moment in the life of my friend. I want those things to be happening all the time. Where we said last week, only God. Only God. Only God. I explained that. Only God. I want those moments. Spending time with Jesus and looking in anticipation for God to move and speak. And finally, Number three, genuine love for all people. Genuine love for all people. The man you crucified, Peter said. The man you crucified. He's laying it on thick. I would not suggest going with this in your, your approach to your friends or at the lab. Saying, you sinners! You guys are the ones that crucified Jesus! Now repent! Uh, could work. Probably not. The man you crucified, sometimes people need it. They need it thick. In this case, they did. Who God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. You would think, you would think that Peter is going to follow this up. Hey, you guys are the one that crucified Jesus. And now you're going to get it. And now you're going to pay. Because you guys got it wrong. We got it right. We win. You lose. Game over. Not what he says. <laughs> Love. There is salvation in no one else, guys. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Love will speak truth. He gives them the truth that these guys <clears throat> needed. Whose lives were on the line here? Whose lives were really on the line? Was it, was it Peter and John? I think Peter and John knew the reality of the situation, that this was not just the moment, it was the eternal perspective. That the men in the room did not get it, they did not fully understand Jesus, and out of love, they shared the truth with them. Guys, your lives are on the line here. Jesus, this is the one. No other name. I wish there was, but this is it. You can't earn it. He already earned it for you. He's given it to you as a gift. There is salvation found in no one else. And then this is amazing. This popped out to me as, we were, as I was prepping this message in verse 15. So they, the Sanhedrin, or the, the high council, ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber. With these men, they asked each other, we can't deny that they perform miraculous signs, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading the propaganda any further, we must warn them 
not to tell, not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. They dismiss Peter and John. They go back to their little secret chambers to have a conversation. How do we, how do we get that conversation? Luke, who authored Acts, how in the world did he get what happened in these secret chambers, these guys who are going after Peter and John here? We know in Scripture, Paul, he was a Pharisee. Pharisee of Pharisees. Got converted, right? We know Nicodemus, John chapter 3. He was the one very curious, Pharisee, very curious about Jesus. There's another Pharisee in, in, uh, in Mark. Asked Jesus, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And, and Jesus tells him what the commandment is. And he says, man, you've answered well. Jesus responds to him saying, you're not far from the kingdom, man. These Pharisees, in a way, were the enemies. But out of love, you can see them as potential allies. I think someone in that room got saved. We don't know who. How did we get this quote? How did we get what happened in these interchanges? I don't, I don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. But I know that these Pharisees, these guys, some of these guys got saved. Peter was, was given a, a, an invitation. Hey, it's Jesus. Scripture says that they went from, they went to 5,000 people that day. In, oh, in, in, in that time. 5,000 men, so even more. God was on the move. These guys were not afraid. They were bold in how they lived. Who you think might be an en enemy might actually be an ally. Peter was here, eventually him and Paul. Paul, as we're going to see in a couple weeks, he went door to door, killing Christians and putting them in jail. And then by the end of his life, he was going door to door, telling people about Jesus. Who you, what you think might actually be a set back, might actually be a set up. Guys got arrested in the middle of their sermon. And hundreds, if not thousands of people got saved. Spirit says, or John, John, 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no love and fear. Sorry. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear. Because fear involves punishment. Living in fear is like its own punishment. It's like its own form of torment. So my question to you today is, where, where are you living in fear? Where is... Where is the enemy got your ear? Where is he shaming you? Where are you holding on to some baggage from your past? Where are you possibly not living up to your potential in the, in, in, in the present where God's calling you to do? These things that, that God is calling us to in our lives. It's like Jeremiah, he's on the wall. I don't want to, I'm scared. Whoa, whoa, I don't know. He was so proud when he took those steps. He was beaming that day. His father was beaming that day. I showed him the replay of the video uh, just last night, and he, he wanted to go do it again. I wanted to go do it again. God wants to use you. He can use you. He wants to use you. He will use you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? That's my prayer for our church. That we live boldly. That we don't question, can God use me? It is, God can use me. How is he going to use me today? Spend time with Jesus. Understand that he has something for you and look for it. And then out of love, just genuinely just love people. Be obedient. Speak, act, care, pray, but love. And then just be amazed at what God does. Let's pray.